I tell you, the Stones boys, uh, you know, Luke and Helena have four boys and a little girl. And um, I think the reason why they had them all is so that we could film them. Aren't, aren't they cute? Isn't that a cute little guy? That's Den Men. And uh, my favorite part is when he lifts up his arms and you can see his little tummy sticking out, you know, and his fists. Anyway, what does this have to do with the series? It's a good question. We are starting a brand new series that's called The Three Hardest Words. And um, in this series, we're going to explore uh, what, you know, many people would say is, a, is the topic of, of topics in the month of February. We're going to talk about love. Um, but as we do, let me just uh, give you a, a, a point on what it is that uh, I want to share with you starting today. And that is that there was a physician who had been with people through the end of their life for decades. And, um, and, and he wrote about his experience with those who were coming to the end of their life. And what he said is there's 11 words that they want to hear more than any other 11 words. And those are, I, I'll miss you, thank you, I forgive you, and I love you. And then he goes on to say that if they can only hear one of those four phrases, the one that they'll choose hands down every time is, I love you. And I began to think about why that is the case. And as, as I reflected on it, what I thought of is the reason why, from my perspective, is because all of those other phrases can be understood, can be implied when you say, I love you. When you say, I love you, therefore I'll miss you, or Therefore, because I love you, I forgive you, or, or whatever, right? Those other phrases can be implied in the phrase, I love you. And yet, it's the, it's the phrase we want to hear the most. It's what we yearn to hear and long to hear the most. Yet, it seems like, for you and for me, when it comes to the relational parts of our lives, it seems like they're the three hardest words to get right consistently and over time. It seems like there's a lot of complication with the I love you phrase, with these three words. Jesus talked about love. In fact, he was asked what the greatest of all commandments were, and he said that both of them are about love, loving God and then loving others. Loving God with everything that you are, every aspect of your life, and then loving those around you as you love your very self. And although we find that it could be difficult to keep every area, every part of our life focused on loving God, absolutely. It seems almost impossible at times to love the people who are around us, the people who irritate us, the people that challenge us, the people who are difficult. Those people who sometimes are closest to us rub us the most. And so when we begin to explore this idea of loving, we're going to talk about why it's so hard to get love right. Why it's so hard to get I love you right. And, and what we're going to talk about is the challenge of loving people through disagreement. About loving people when you feel unlovable yourself. Loving people when you're just so lonely, you feel like you're disconnected from everybody. And loving people even though there's deep pain in your life. And all of these four, what we'll be talking about over the next month, they really reflect the idea that this is a really it's a real topic, but it's also a hard topic. And so I want to talk today about how to love in the midst of disagreement. And now when I, when I begin to open up that, that topic and when I begin to explore where I could go with this, how many of you know we are a culture of disagreements, right? People equal disagreements. It just happens. And so as I begin to consider this, I thought, my goodness, I can go anywhere, I could talk about ideologies, I could talk about religions, I could talk about uh, perspectives, I, I could talk about governments, I could, you know, I, could, I could go anywhere. So what I had to do is I had to narrow it down. And so what I, wanna, what I feel would be the most relevant to you today is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about how to deal with the disagreements that you have with those who are near to you. I'm thinking spouse, I'm thinking parent, I'm thinking children, I'm thinking neighbor, coworker. Those who are near to you, who you interact with on a regular basis, how do you continue a loving and respectful relationship with those kind of people, with those people, when you have a disagreement? And I want to help you today. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to share this with you. I really believe this is a helpful message for you. So, so let's, uh, let's lean in together. So I'll start with some good news. I have good news to share with you, and this is important as we set a foundation for um, interacting with one another through disagreement. Love 
is not contingent upon agreeing with someone. I'm going to say it again. Love is not contingent upon agreeing with someone. You see, I think in, in some ways we've tied these two together, that if we're really going to express love, we're going to find agreement. And I want you to understand that that is not the case. You can untether those two. Love and agreement are not the same thing. And this truth alone will revolutionize the challenging relationships in your life because you're not looking for agreement. You're looking to express and to function in love. And they're not the same. And so you can work this out. And so I want to encourage you with that. I want to talk to you about this because, you see, what will happen to us is sometimes someone will mandate an agreement with someone else in order to express love. Let me explain what I mean. To mandate that I agree with another person's perspective in order to show love is what we would call conditional love. That the only way that you can really express love is if you agree with me. That's putting conditions on love. It's interesting how we put conditional love on people and we expect conditional love from them. It's what we are conditioned to experience. It's what our world gives us. It's what we naturally give to one another. But conditional love has another name, if you will, and it's called manipulation. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. I'll give you a couple of thoughts. The first one is this. If you, I, I will love you if. I will love you if. And maybe you've had some experience with this. All of us have experienced conditional love at times. I will love you if. I will love you until you offend me. I will love you until you don't support my cause. I will love you only if you love me back in the way that I want to be loved. That's conditional love. And that's putting a stipulation on love. And then you can flip it. And you can use this as a manipulative force. And I've seen this happen. If you love me, you will. You see, so one is, I will love you if. The other is, if you love me, you will. Both are conditional and a form of manipulation. Putting a stipulation on love that, doesn't, that love doesn't deserve, right? Love is beautiful. Love is grandiose. Love is all-encompassing. Love is untethered, and yet we would desire to tether it. In this way, if you love me, you must. I'm, I'm running into a strange cultural phenomenon. And I, and I think you can see it, too, in a number of places. It affects our relationships drastically. It affects our worldview drastically. And I just want to point it out. I don't have a solution for it, but I think within the context of Christian community, we can work this out and we can weed it out. And that's this strange phenomenon that there's a progression of what love actually means. So as I just mentioned to you, love and agreement do not have to be married together. But in our culture, what I'm discovering is love and acceptance are also being married together. And now all of us would say, I need love and acceptance. I need to feel that I belong. I need to feel safe. And I get that, and I understand that. But what I've discovered is my definition of acceptance and other people's definition of acceptance are not the same thing. And so when someone says, I want to be loved and accepted, we really don't know exactly what they mean. So for some, and this is where the phenomenon comes into play, for some, they would suggest that love equals acceptance, but acceptance equals affirmation, and affirmation equals advocation. So I want you to go with me on this journey. In other words, if you love me, you will. If you love me, you will accept my perspective as your own. If you love me, you will affirm my perspective as right. And if you love me, you will advocate for my perspective to everyone else. And that's what love looks like. If you don't do all of this, you don't love me. And friends, that's what's going on in our culture. And it makes it really hard for us as followers of Jesus, who may in some way differ with others, other followers of Jesus and others who have different perspectives, for us to express love because love doesn't mean love. Love means acceptance, affirmation, and advocation. And that puts us in a very difficult place. But I want to redefine the picture of love for us because we certainly can love and disagree. 
we certainly can untether these two things. They do not have to be married. Unconditional love finds a way to love even when we disagree. It's unconditional love that says to a child, I completely disapprove of your behavior, but I deeply love you as your parent. It's, it's, it's unconditional love that says as a spouse, I hold you in very high honor, and I, I embrace you with deep love, but I choose a different thought process in this disagreement. It's, a, it's that unconditional love that says to a coworker, I respect your opinion while still holding on to the one that I believe to be dear to me. It's also unconditional love that from a parent, as an adult, you would say, I respect and honor you, but I will respectfully make my own choices about this particular issue. You see, that is what unconditional love looks like. It untethers all the other encumbrances that keep love conditional. And it says, I will practice a love that transcends the limitations that our culture has put on the definition of love. And so that allows us to find a place to stand when we disagree. It gives us hope about the future. In fact, the Bible helps us understand unconditional love. If you look into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's known as the love chapter. Really, it should be called the relationship chapter because it's all about human relationships. It's all about the interaction of people. And it sets a very high, lofty, unconditional perspective on love. And, and really, it starts by setting a foundation that says, man, I can be like super spiritual. I can have a, 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 an angelic language. I can prophesy. I can have deep discernment and understand all the mysteries. But Paul says, he's the writer, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. He says, if we don't get love right, these three hardest words, if we don't get love right, then really we've missed the point. And so that's what... This, this particular passage calls us to, and then it begins to give us some definition to that, and I want us to look at that. In verse 7, it tells us what love always does. Verse 7 of chapter 13 says this, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, this particular verse needs definition, and I'll give you some in just a minute, but understand, this is a great picture of unconditional love. Notice how difficult this kind of love is to work out in life. Because this isn't some pie-in-the-sky thing. This is about people. This is about relationships. And so there is some challenge to us here in this particular verse. In another place in the same passage, just up above what I read to you, in like verses 4 and 5, it tells us what love isn't. It says that love isn't boastful, and it isn't angry, and it isn't selfish, and it isn't rude, and it isn't dishonoring. So, so we have these two pictures. One says love is always these things, and love is never these things. And so when we look at these two passages in the same, you know, these two verses same sec in the same section, we understand now why I love you is the three hardest words to get right. Because <laughs> love always and love never. <laughs> And for us, we have to say, mm, unconditional love is quite a challenge, and I get that. So how can I help you to love in the midst of disagreement? We're going to spend the rest of our time talking about how to love when you disagree, okay? And I'm going to give you four thoughts, and then we'll just have, you know, kind of a conversation around them. And some of it will apply to your situation, some of it won't, and that's okay, because this is a wide and diverse group, and I trust that God has something for you today in this message. So how to love when you disagree. The first thing I want to give you, first thought I want to give you is this. Fight the need to be right. Fight the need to be right. Now, this seems counterintuitive, because the whole reason why you're having a disagreement is because you think you're right. <laughs> right? Why would we be arguing if I think I'm wrong? Well, there are some people who argue with a fence post, so, you know... Those people exist, but for the most of us, we're arguing because we're passionately feeling like this is something we believe. This is something we're holding on to. And, and the problem is, is we have to fight the need to be right because right and wrong isn't really the win. I'm right, you're wrong is not a win. The win is love. 
So when is love? So how do we find love? How do you love in the midst of disagreement? Just because you're right doesn't mean you aren't also wrong. Because your perspective can be right and your spirit can be so wrong. Your, your, your perspective can be right and your attitude can be so wrong. Your perspective can be right and your words can be so hurtful. Right? And so just because you're right doesn't mean that you're not also wrong. You see, this, this first part of that verse that we're going to kind of camp on says, Love always protects. And, and, and this word is quite interesting. This Greek word for protect, it actually means better translated cover. Cover. And I, we get that picture of like shielding someone, protecting someone, of course. But, but we get a broader context because the verse actually does imply what we say. And so in this verse, what we're learning is that the writer is saying, if you love, you will cover, you will protect, you will shield, but you will also cover up the faults of others, and you will also cover up your own mouth when you're going to say something you shouldn't. That's the picture here. Love always protects. And the only way to function in a way where you cover, where you look past faults, where you cover up your own mouth, the only way to function that way is by the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of the fruit of the Spirit is necessary if you're going to practice this verse of always protecting. You're going to have to do something that the Holy Spirit is going to work in you, the work of self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You need it because you have things you want to say. They are on your mind and you can grit your teeth together and say it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, we've all been there. We have all been there. And I I think the way that the way that love protects in conversation and interactions is by displaying reticence. Now, reticence is not, a, it's not a, a, as common of a word in our vocabulary, but do you know what reticence means? Reticence means to not reveal one's thoughts or feelings readily. Sometimes we feel like I'm just being true to myself. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. Hey, I'm just being real. No, 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 no. You're not being real. You're, you're, you're failing to display reticence. And, and reticence is a gift in the midst of a difficult conversation. It's not the time to say everything you want to say. It's not the moment where you fight to be right. You see, when Jesus came, the Bible says he came full of grace and truth. And I love what Pastor Chris Hodges, one of the pastors I really admire, says about this verse. He says that truth without grace is mean, and grace without truth is meaningless. Grace and truth together are good medicine. And so we find this concept of, I can be right, but I can be wrong, right? I can be so right and yet be so very wrong. It it reminds me of the story of the woman caught in adultery. Because in the context, Jesus is there. The religious leaders who followed the law of Moses and had added to that law brought a woman who they say had been caught in the act of adultery, which was a punishable offense, punishable by stoning. And you don't, I'm not talking about smoking marijuana. It's different, right? It, it's about throwing rocks. And so they brought this woman, they threw her at the feet of Jesus, and immediately Jesus bends down and starts writing in the ground. He knows what's going on. And they all say to him, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The Bible says, this is John 8, if you want to look it up sometime. The Bible says that we should stone her. What do you say? And, and Jesus just keeps writing in the ground. I love it. It's like... It's awesome. (laughs) It is so kind of John Wayne, you know. He's just writing in the ground here, right? And as he's writing in the ground, I wonder what he's writing. I mean, all of us could speculate. Was he writing their name and then all the sins that they had committed that day alone? What was it that he was actually writing? But at some point, he gets up and he says to them, you shared a truth. Let me balance it with grace. And he says, any of you who is without sin, go ahead. Cast a stone. And the Bible says that one by one, they dropped their stones and went away. Jesus looked at this woman and said to her, where are those that accused you? And she said, they're all gone. And Jesus speaks truth to her and grace. He says, neither do I condemn you. He doesn't say you don't deserve to be condemned. He says, neither do I condemn 
you, and then he adds an element of truth to it that is so profound it actually brings transformation because it's good medicine, because it's balanced with grace. He says, go and leave your life of sin. So he says, what you're doing is actually wrong, but I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to give you hope about tomorrow. And so he speaks into her life. She gets up and she leaves. And I believe with all my heart that at that moment her life was transformed because she experienced truth and grace. And one of the things that we have to fight is we have to fight the need to be right. Because what leaves when we have to be right is grace. It, it, it evacuates. It can't exist anymore when we just have to be right. When we have to win the argument, grace is gone, friends. We play dirty. And when we add grace back in, we lose that need to be right. And we begin to understand that until we grasp love, our truth has no place in someone else's life. And so we need to begin to understand it's not about being right. Our airtight arguments are not what matter the most. If love isn't present, we've lost something. I think this is a major error. Even Now let me talk within the, the Christian community for just a minute. Because within the Christian community, we might think because we're all Christians, you know, or because we go to the same church, we can practice accountability without relationship. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. In, in order to explain it, let me give you a quote that's from Bob Goff. I just read his second book that was called Everybody Everywhere, and it's all about love. And he says this, he says, I can't think of one example where Jesus held people accountable the way we hold people accountable. The way we hold people accountable pushes them from us. We can use words like brother and sister in a Christian sense and then treat people like strangers. And then he says this, which I thought was very interesting. He said, Jesus didn't hold people accountable. He held them close. And what I sense there is that, of course, when we read the scriptures, we see Jesus you know, telling Peter, get behind me, Satan. We see correction in the storyline. But the context is correction came after closeness. Correction came out of relationship. Correction came out of a deep sense of bond and, and, and connection. And sometimes we throw truth bombs at people and, and blow up their world and let the shrapnel go where it may. And we feel like in some ways we're right in doing that. Friends, it's not right. It's not what we're called to. Your argument can be right and you can be so very, very wrong. So fight the urge to be right by choosing to first be loving. The second thought I want to give you here, and, and I'll, I'll move quicker in these next two just to, for time's sake. The second one I want to give you is when you're in the midst of that disagreement, how do you keep love going there? I would say put trust in the gap. Put trust in the gap. And, and this is something that, you know, I, We've been learning as a staff, and it's something that works really well in your working environment because you're going to have a tendency to see something, observe something, know a part of the story, and fill in the gaps. There's always a gap in what we think and what we see and what we actually know, what we actually know. And so we have a tendency, we have to fill in the gap. So there's always a gap. Sometimes we see the gap. And the question is, what are we going to put in the gap? And, um, and, and, and where this teaching came from and how it helped us learn is we said, you know what, you've got two options. You can put trust in that gap or you can put suspicion in that gap. It's easier to put suspicion. It's easier to think negatively about your coworkers. It's easier to think negatively about the things that you don't know. It's just so easy for us to go there. And the reason why... In the words of uh, Patrick Lencioni from his book, The Advantage, he says it's called fundamental attribution error. And that's just a, a fancy way of saying I give myself a lot of grace and I give people a lot of truth. That's what it's saying. In other words, if I think about myself in context to a deadline, let's take a work scenario. Say you had a work scenario and there was a deadline and the deadline wasn't met. If you didn't meet the deadline, you would put in that you know, in that you would attribute that to your environment. You know, there was this problem, there was this slowdown, there was this accident, the dog ate my homework, my computer blew up, I got a flat tire, whatever it would be, this is why I'm late, this is why it's not done. For yourself, you'd have a tendency to blame the environment. For others, you have a tendency to blame their character. 
So they're lazy, they don't care, they don't manage their time well, and so on and so forth. And here's the way that we keep trust in the gap. Because you know what the Bible says? The Bible says uh, that love always trusts. The way that we keep trust in the gap is by giving others the same benefit of the doubt we would give ourselves. Let's start there. Let's start with putting trust in the gap. Let's start with giving others the same benefit of the doubt that we would give ourselves. Now, um, when I was, when I was kind of thinking through this, I was reading some commentaries. And one of the commentaries I read was so cool. When it got to this part on love always trusts, here's what it said. It said, love takes the best and kindest views of all men and all circumstances as long as it is possible to do so. Love takes the best and kindest views of all men and all circumstances as long as it is possible to do so. And that's how we practice trust. Now, you can get to a place. My microphone's being a little funny here. Tommy, what should I do? He, he's going like this. I should go like that. Up, up. Is that better? He said this. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. We'll keep moving here. So uh, when, we start to, when we start to actually unpack uh, trust to, like, you know, you extrapolate it out, we get to a place where it's no longer safe to trust, and I understand that. So when I say put trust in the gap, I, I want to go with the commentaries on that one as long as it is possible. At some point, you're foolish to continue to trust because of the woundedness, because of the uh, the devastation that that might cause you and because of someone else's brokenness and how that would be projected upon you. So at some point, you have to you have to understand that trust is a risk. And at some point, you can't trust people. But here's what I know. The way that you choose this verse of always trusting is that when you can no longer trust a person, you can still always entrust them to God. In other words, God is trustworthy. And at some point, the relationship breaks down. The, the, the disagreement becomes so fierce. At some point, you feel that it's too dangerous to continue to trust and you have to back off. But that doesn't mean that this command is now gone. What it means is it changes. No longer am I able to trust the person, but I'm still trusting God with that person. I'm still trusting God that he's going to transform their life. I'm still trusting God. I'm still praying that God would intervene in this situation. And in so doing, you can practice this command, this blessing of always, always trusting. Third thought I'm going to give you is this. How do you continue in a loving relationship, even when there's disagreement? The third thing is to communicate hope. Communicate hope. I can't tell you how important this is in the midst of a disagreement. I'm, I'm thinking husband and wife. I'm thinking parent and child. I, I'm thinking deep relational places. You've got to communicate hope. And I, I have to tell you, you know, when, when Lisa and I argue, it is her fault. <laughs> but, but beyond that, just kidding, sweetie. We've decided that we're never going to fight on the way to church. I don't know about you. Maybe you're here today and you had a fight on the way to church. So we take separate cars. Works every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> so anyway, when, when we're in the midst of an argument, um, w when there's a challenge there, it's so important and, it, and it, it's so healing to communicate hope. We're going to get through this. I'm committed to you. We've made a decision. We're going to stand by that decision. I want to understand. Let's work on this some more. Hey, listen, this is an issue, but we still love each other. It's so important that in the midst of that place that you communicate hope. And I'll tell you why. Because it's easier to give up than to give hope. It really is. It's a lot easier to give up than to give hope. And hope is what we need. You know, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Hope is the oxygen of the soul. It's the oxygen of the human spirit. And the thing about hope is that hope makes a decision to continue to believe Hope is a confident expectation in what we're yet to see. And so we've got to keep hope alive. Hope is so important. And hope chooses to shift from that which brings disunity. Not because it doesn't see it, because it's present, but, but in thinking about it and focusing on it, it is empowered in a way that consumes the rest of what may be okay or even very good. 
And so it's really important that we keep hope alive. And what I've learned is that hope actually starves our differences and feeds our love. And so that's why hope is so very important. Continue to communicate hope. And what I mean is that when you start to disagree with someone, apart from, from the love of God, apart from this unconditional love, you're giving a, a, an a opportunity for division and you're giving, you're empowering that division in a way that's not your task or your job or your goal. See, the point is there's already someone who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the Bible says. His, he's the devil. And let him do his job. Don't help him. Right? Don't help him. Choose hope. Keep hope alive. And the fourth and final thing, and, and I'm closing with this, is really if, if, if you want to love through disagreement, you have to play the long game. It's a long game. And... And in this long game, you have to understand that the Bible says love always perseveres. Perseveres. There's an element here of perseverance that's so very, very important. You know, I've, <clears throat> I've never wanted to bungee jump. It seems like a really bad idea to me, personally. Um, but I have been interested at times to... Um, jump out of an airplane. And what would make me want to jump out of an airplane but not bungee jump? I don't know. Maybe you're just farther away. You have more time to prepare yourself, right? <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But for some reason, I've thought of skydiving as being like, wow, that would be amazing. Sort of. But bungee jumping, not really. I am afraid of heights. Um, but, you know, I, I came across this this, uh, this thought over the last few weeks, and, and it's a little bit of a strange thought, but go with me. One of the things that I was studying about, you know, jumping out of an airplane is what happens if your parachute doesn't open? I mean, it's a good thing to at least consider, right, before you jump out of an airplane. And so as I was considering this, what, what I learned is, is that when you hit the ground the first time, you don't necessarily die. Is that encouraging news? I don't know. But what happens to you at that time is there's internal damage that's done to your bones. And then you bounce. <laughs> and when you come down again, that's when life ends. And I guess what I thought about is there's a parallel here to what we're talking about. Because if we're going to practice unconditional love, we got to recognize that there's going to be some times where it's like, Someone we love, or someone we're trying to love, hit the ground pretty hard. You know, this disagreement, this conflict, whatever. And it's like we're standing there, and they've just hit the ground, and they're going up. And conditional love would say, well, you just, you didn't get that parachute open. And let them fall. But I think there's something in the heart of God that would have you and me run and soften that fall catch them as they're coming down and maybe save the relationship maybe save a life but then somehow do what unconditional love would do and I think that's the picture God wants to leave us with let's learn to catch people on the bounce if we're going to have disagreements if we're going to have relational conflict but let's not allow that second devastation to ruin what God would want to heal and repair. Let's run to people and let's catch them on the bounce. I want to pray with you now. And as we begin to pray, I'm really thinking of two things. One, you've heard me talk about unconditional love. And I've talked about it in a way that sets a pretty high bar for us as humans. And the reason why I do that is because there's really no one who's ever loved perfectly but Jesus. And Jesus not only loved perfectly, he loves you perfectly. And maybe you're here today and what you need more than anything is you need to reach out and take hold of the unconditional love that God has for you. His unconditional love that is present in Jesus. Receive Jesus today and experience unconditional love, the kind of love that always runs to you.
kind of love that always catches you on the bounce. The, the kind of love that lays down its life for you. That's what Jesus is. So the message that we always share here is that your greatest place of hope is in the arms of Jesus. So place your life there. If you've never done that, I want to invite you to do it. It's simple. Not because it wasn't costly, but because the cost has been paid. Jesus paid a cost for you, and now you simply receive him. Invite him into your life. Jesus, come and be Lord here. Come and lead this life. Take me where you want me to go. I, I'll follow you. I'll learn to experience your love and to replicate that love as you transform my life. That's really what we're praying into. And the second thing is, I, I believe that there are people here, and you're a follower of Jesus, but you understand relational conflict. You have someone who's dear to you in your life, maybe extremely close to you, that you have either a consistent or a, a current difficult time with. There's an ongoing battle. There's a disagreement. Maybe it's a number of disagreements. And I want to pray for you that God would empower you with his spirit in a way that allows grace to shine through your life, that he'd literally pour into your life his precious spirit that will teach you to love like Jesus and that he would provide a reprieve because we know there's an enemy who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, would, would offer you a reprieve so that you can have a time to catch your breath and reset in that relationship. Can we believe today that God could heal marriages? Can we believe today that God could restore parent and child relationships? Could we believe today that that hostile environment at work could transform? That that funny thing that happened with the neighbor could somehow be resolved and we could live in peace? And, and whatever your scenario might be. Heavenly Father, we now pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would flood this house with unconditional love. For those that need to receive Christ, that they would sense that he is the giver of unconditional love. He is the example of unconditional love. And they would certainly attach their lives to him. They would whisper a simple prayer that says, Jesus, come into my life. Bring your love into me. Transform me by your love. And for those of us who are here, and, and, and there's, a, there's a situation that's so clear in our minds right now. There's a relationship it's a conflict. We're asking in Jesus' name that you certainly would do just what I said, Lord, that you would pour your grace into that situation. You would pour your spirit upon those who have felt limited in their capacity to handle the difficulty, and you would give them great capacity by your spirit, capacity to express unconditional love. Let your love win the day, because, Lord, we need you we need you because we are desperate to be right. We want so desperately to be right. We so desperately need your help to put trust in the gap because it's not natural for us, Lord. We, we, we need you to give us hope so we can communicate hope to others. And Lord, Lord God, we need patience. We need perseverance in the midst of this, Lord. So we ask you to come to help us. And in Jesus' name, I just claim healing for marriages. In Jesus' name, places of deep brokenness being healed supernaturally by the power of God. Perspectives that have been so different now coming into alignment. Lord, breathe hope into marriages in Jesus' name. There's marriages right now that are just feeling so hopeless. Breathe hope into them in Jesus' name. God, I, I pray for a, that parent that feels estranged from their child and their heart is broken over it. God, oh Lord. Bring a healing in Jesus' name for that child that has such a barrier, such a wall up with their parent. Lord, would you soften that wall? Would you bring a place of wellness in relationship? And, and God, I pray for sometimes the atmosphere in our workplaces is so negative and so awful, we don't even want to go back tomorrow. Lord, can we just invite your presence to go there before us? you just show up in that workplace 
breathe your life and your spirit into that place. We pray for those that we have conflict with in Jesus' name. We pray that you would help them, that you really would bless them, that you would allow them to find rest and peace from the, the turmoil in their own lives that causes them such upset. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that even workplaces would be transformed by unconditional love. So we thank you for this, Lord. We know we need your help because I love you is certainly the three hardest words to get right. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.